How are you, man? I'm Gil Roth, and you're listening to a bonus episode of my Virtual Memory Show podcast. This is a COVID check-in episode where I record with a past guest of the Virtual Memory Show to find out how they're holding up during the pandemic. As far as how I'm doing, meh, a little down today. Partly it's from overeating yesterday, but the overeating is just a symptom of anxiety, which I need to watch out for because that leads to depression and blah, blah, blah. Um, but after this episode goes up, I'm planning on getting out for a nice run. And then I have a bunch of conference calls and business calls set for today. So I'll be busy, which is maybe good. I am starting to contemplate the next steps for, for the podcast uh, since the daily schedule might be running its course. Um, I'd like to get back to full length shows, but that means recording full length with people I don't know, which will be challenging because of the dynamic of conversation that I've cultivated over 370 of the regular podcasts. I think maybe I'll get back to doing like one of those a week and downshift the number of COVID check-ins. I just don't know. I mean, I know from the feedback I get from some of you that you actually like having these these daily shows. I know nobody's listening to all of them, but uh, I don't know. I'll, I'll see what I can do. Now, today's guest uh, had a much tougher time dealing with pandemic podcast problems. Uh, author Scott Edelman joins me from West Virginia, and Scott is the creator of the podcast Eating the Fantastic, where he would sit down for a meal with a fantasy, science fiction, or comics writer and have a fun conversation, kind of like what I do here. Um, but thanks to the self-isolation and social distancing measures, he can't meet up with anyone. So rather than accommodate like I have with the, the remote thing, he's put the show on hiatus after about 120 episodes. And I'm not judging. The, the, the meal thing is integral to how Scott has those conversations and not being able to have that, as he'll tell you, um, defeats the purpose of eating the fantastic. I mean, we both get that if the biggest change in our lives due to COVID-19 uh, is that we have to change or quit doing our podcast, we are getting by pretty goddamn easy. Um, but it still means that he's given up something he really loved doing. And anyway, um, we had a good conversation. And after we finished recording, Scott sent over the following. So you guys would have some idea who he is, as he put it. During our conversation, he writes, I never got to brag that I had three more short stories come out this year, including my 99th, that one appearing in Dream Forge magazine, and my 100th will be out later this year in the anthology Prisms from PS Publishing. My most recent short story collection is Tell Me Like You Done Before and Other Stories Written on the Shoulders of Giants, which gathers all the stories honoring writers who inspired me. So that's Scott. Now, as caveats go, uh, some weird static clicks on his line. That's about it. Here's me and Scott. How are you dealing? How are you coping? How am I coping? Well, my life is not very much different than it usually is because I spend most of the time in my house getting writing done. The main change is that all of my friends have vanished into a ghost town. Uh, May would have had me attend three different conventions, Awesome Con, the Nebula Awards Weekend, and Balticon, where I would have partied with friends, and two of those three events have become virtual. Uh, I am unable to record new episodes of my own podcast, Eating the Fantastic, which is going to be going on a hiatus since it has a conceit different from yours in that I take people out for meals and we sit down across from each other and just babble on uh, so people are eavesdropping on friends having a meal and for some reason we can't get into restaurants these days so that actually ends up being the main change to my life at the moment because for the first time in four and a half years i have no upcoming meal dates with friends to record episodes of my podcast so i am in rural west virginia i leave my eight acres maybe once every 15 16 days to go shopping, fill the freezer with food, and that's it. And I feel quite lucky to be here on Eight Acres because I know there are folks who are in tiny little apartments in cities who go 
mad with cabin fever and I could just step outside and clear brush and wander around and look at the daffodils and garden and so on and not feel trapped the way some people are. Trying to get Do writing remember, done. Yeah. Is, is the is pandemic, social distance, et cetera, leaching into your writing? either explicitly or implicitly at this point? It is hard to say because the last election has so seeped into my writing that I don't know that there's room for a pandemic in there as well. <laughs> mm. For the last few years, it has been difficult for me to write optimistic science fiction where things work out well at the end. So I've been fighting back against that anyway for the last couple of years. So to have this additional layer of things going wrong with the world is really not that additional for the way I perceive things is going. Uh, after the last election, it took me quite a bit to get out of a writer's block, and I ended up having to finally write a story about what was going wrong in our timeline that was published in a, an anthology called If This Goes On, which was meant to address the events of Charlottesville and other things that were happening in this country, edited by Kat Rambo. And I had a story called uh, The Stranded Time Traveler Embraces the Inevitable about someone coming back in time trying to set our timeline right. And our president is in that story. Or rather, mm -hmm. yes, our president is as is his father. Um, and I had that's the story that I wrote to deal with breaking out of that and getting the juices flowing again and uh, dealing with what's happening in this world because... Uh, they say in a time like this, people need hopeful fiction, fiction that tells you of better times and better places and better futures. But sometimes when you're in that present, it's hard to write about that future. So um, there I, are say, I, mean, I just I just finished Gibson's new novel, which uh, apparently he scrapped hundreds of pages of after the election and had to rewrite from the beginning. But well, I have mixed feelings about how it turned out. But, yeah, I you know. haven't I read that book yet, but as an example, there's one story that I wrote recently that is still making the rounds. I just started sending it out. It takes place in the future. There's a generation starship. And I found it hard to imagine a future in which there was an American aboard that generation starship. All of the names were... Indian names and, uh, you know, Chinese and Japanese and uh, Brazilian and so forth, that uh, it was hard to imagine a future. And though I did not speak of the fact that, gee, where will America be in 100 or 150 years, uh, the absence of any names that were clearly identifiable as what people stereotypically think of as an American name is a subtext in that story. As you see, everyone mentioned, you know, is Japanese, uh, derived from Japanese, Chinese, etc. cetera, um, names. Uh, so writing about the future, I found it hard to imagine a positive one for this country that will get out of this alive. Hmm. Do you envision a short-term future where you're, uh, you're sitting at a table in a restaurant with a guest again? Oh, it is very difficult. I was looking back, I was reminded uh, of old photos. These days, our iPhones tell us, here's what you were doing on this date. And right. there was a photo of me in Austin, Texas, at a World Horror Convention, having a meal with friends, after which we then went to a bridge and stood in a crowd to watch the bats take off as the sun set. And the idea of getting in a plane, flying somewhere, gathering with friends in a restaurant. I think we had 10 of us at the table, which ex even the restaurants that are opening now under some governor's orders are not allowing more than six at the table. And then going and standing in a bridge with a mob of people to watch bats, <laughs> yeah. which are part of our current timeline story, to watch bats. There were hundreds of thousands of them under that particular bridge in Austin. I don't remember the bridge. So I looked at that photo and there were four different things that I could not conceive of at the moment. The plane, the crowd, the restaurant, the friends. Um, I would like it to happen. Uh, all of my conventions in May, let's see, June have canceled. July have canceled. Uh, August has canceled. Uh, the next possible time I can imagine being at a convention with friends at the moment is October, which is the Baltimore Book Festival, which I very much enjoy and Cap Clive and the World Fantasy Convention. Will we be in a world in October where I feel comfortable 
boarding an airplane and flying to LA for this, this or that. Uh, it's difficult to imagine at the moment that we'll get through that. We're waiting for the second wave of COVID-19 to arise with everyone loosening restrictions way too early. So even October, I'm saying, gee, I hope I'll be able in October to get together with friends and be in a restaurant uh, because uh, I, that has been part of my life for so long. I normally attend maybe a dozen conventions a year. And these virtual ones are not quite the same. I was practicing sure. for Balticon. Uh, we were having a practice session. Can we all make the technology work for the panels that we'll be doing in this virtual convention at the end of May over the Memorial Day weekend? And one person said to me, but Scott, how are you going to feed us? Because <laughs> I, I usually show up at these conventions every day. I bring a dozen donuts. The last reader con, I showed up with a couple of dozen mini cannolis. Uh, I've got a four pound jar of jelly beans that I was going to be giving out in a couple of weeks at the Nebula Awards. We, I normally do that. I just sort of, if I'm on a panel, I bring food and feed the audience because a fed audience is a happy audience. I walk around parties and offer people things because that's, that's how human beings sort of bond. That's, uh, you know, giving food to someone and sharing food, uh, builds a sense of community and builds friendships. And that's always what I did. But long before the podcast, that's why when I was inspired by what you do uh, and what other people do with their podcast to, to invent mine and build it around food, it's, that's a very important thing to me. And the loss of that, uh, that's, that's probably the most painful part at the moment that I am not saying, gee, I'm going to be at AwesomeCon three days from now here in D.C., 80,000 people were going to gather at the convention center for Awesome Con, which is a comic book uh, convention, not quite as big as San Diego, which is often canceled. And, and they wisely canceled this, but I was going to get together with Roy Thomas, my old boss from Marvel Comics, who was my first editor-in-chief in 1974 when I was hired there, and sit down with him and have a meal and talk about old times and pull together an episode of the podcast and I was going to get together with some new people to make friends with who I had not, who I didn't really know uh, that well. So uh, the loss of things like that is uh, what I end up finding to be the most painful and the, and the largest loss. But, uh, you know, as I said, out here in West Virginia, normally I leave the property unless I'm going to a convention, I might only step off the property once a week to, to go shopping. So it's really the loss of that convention life that has changed my life the most. Is it a Sophie's Choice thing to ask what your favorite festival or con is? My favorite one, as maybe I've told you this before, it has always been Reader Con, which has changed in many, many ways over the last, uh, I'm going to do the math in my head. I went to the first one in 1987. And one of the reasons I like that convention the most is it, it always uh, had panels that were not just 101 panels. If you've been to conventions as I have since 1970, 4th of July weekend, we're coming up on the 50th anniversary of the first convention I went to at age 15. If you go to these things long enough, you know that panels are often 101. The panel will be something like sex and science fiction or horror short stories. And people begin at ground zero and slowly build up to the most interesting thing by about the 50 minute point when yeah. you have to and end our time is up. up. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, and ReaderCon in their descriptions of the panels are so sharply focused that often you can scrape away all that 101, begin and do a deep dive into a particular topic. So I, I very much like the way they do uh, their intense panel descriptions to try and keep people, hey, if we talk about this one tiny aspect with diamond precision, laser-like precision, maybe we can accomplish something and reveal something new rather than it being a panel that you've heard 50 times before if you've been going to conventions forever as I have. And it is a very weird thing to think that 4th of July weekend, 1970, just a few months shy, 50 years ago, I walked into a convention for the first time, which totally changed my life, entering this community of 
fandom. It was first a comic book convention then, and from the freebie table of flyers, I learned about the science fiction conventions and then went to a Lunacon, then went to the first Star Trek convention that was ever held, and then my first Worldcon, World Science Fiction Convention in 74. So this has been an intimate part of my life for 50 years. So when I say that suddenly not having that, suddenly sitting here at the beginning of convention season, when I would, over the next six weeks, be going to four different conventions and hanging out with friends and maybe seeing you or not seeing you in July. And uh, you know, normally I see you at SPX coming up in, what is that, September? Um, that ain't happening. I mean, Warren gave an interview about it yesterday, but it basically isn't happening. They just can't officially cancel. Right. So is that normally in September, right? So even as far away yeah. as September, because of the planning stages. And the other thing, even not with conventions, my wife and I like operettas. And since, let's see, since, let's see, 2012, we have been going to Worcester, Ohio, to the Ohio Light Opera. They do seven different operettas. They started with Gilbert and Sutherland. They moved on to Lehar and Strauss and uh, Kalman and all sorts of other operettas. And we were going to be there in July. And they canceled, I think, six weeks ago because it's not just an event. It's months of rehearsal to put on these seven different performances. And they normally do things, aside from the Gilbert and Sullivan, that have not been performed in the United States for as much as 90 years. The, the one that I miss the most is there was going to be an operetta version of Jules Verne's From the Earth to the Moon that <laughs> was written 10 years after the novel came out. And I think it has not been done in anything but a stage performance for 70 or 80 years. And they were going to put that on. And for a science fiction fan, to see an operetta based on a work by Jules Verne was going to be quite fascinating. So that's gone as well. And that's something we've been doing every year since 2012. Not a convention, but still a time to gather but with the people. Things, yeah. The traditions and the things that we the, 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 we enjoy, the things that we build our lives around. Right. Yeah. So that's that's gone. And I was going to see uh, fellow science fiction writers and fans, uh, Jeff Landis and Mary Tazilla. We turned them on to this, and they've been going the last couple of years since we were going to see them there as well. So that's gone. So I'm sitting here hoping that by the time of October, I'll be willing. That's a, it's really a two-part story for all of us, isn't it? People can open things. That doesn't mean anyone's willing to go. Okay. And I know there's a convention coming up. There's something called the NASFIC, which is the North American Science Fiction Convention, which happens any year that the World Science Fiction Convention occurs outside of the United States. There's this other thing held within the United States for folks who can't travel. Well, they canceled the one that's in New Zealand this year. It will be virtual. But the counter convention, which is in August in Columbus, Ohio, has said, well, we're still going on, but... Uh, unless we get canceled by the state, but please tell us, are you considering coming? <laughs> they sent that out <laughs> yesterday because if they hold a party and nobody shows up, where are they? So they said, if you're not coming, please cancel your hotel so we know you're not coming and we can plan on, on what we're doing. So come October, if they say, yes, we're going to take over the Inner Harbor once more in Baltimore and have this wonderful event. I, I truly love the Baltimore Book Festival because unlike many other conventions is takes over the inner harbor. It feels more like a carnival. <laughs> you know, they have a Ferris wheel and people are, uh, you know, selling cotton candy and their little book stalls all along the inner harbor and the science fiction writers of America and the romance writers of America and other people have this convention. And what's uh, wonderful about it is that unlike the conventions you and I are used to, like ReaderCon, where you are preaching to the choir, people make a decision oh, there's this convention I'm going to attend. You can be in this tent and people are wandering by. They just want to have a good day at the Inner Harbor and go to the aquarium. And someone might look over and say, hey, what, what's that? That thing that says Science Fiction Writers of America. And a number of times I've been doing a panel and some kid says, Ma, Ma, can I hang out here? And you see their eyes light up. They know nothing about the fan world of science fiction. They love the books. They love the movies. Yeah. They've never met a writer. They don't know there's a community. And you've given them that first taste. And they've sat there for a couple of hours watching a panel. And the serendipity 
of seeing an unfamiliar face and seeing their eyes light up when uh, they're there. And, and, I, and a number of times I've seen a little kid, 12 or 13, said, say, raise their hand, say, gee, I'm working on a novel. How, you know, can you tell me how you do this or that? And hmm. that contact with someone new uh, is just an amazing thing. I would hate to think that in October we were not ready again to have that part. To me, ju not just with the community that we know the community has exists, the friends we've already made, but to do that outreach to future friends, strangers who don't know they're your friends yet, who don't know this world and to pull them in. So I'm, I'm hoping that by October we have wa wandered through this and things have settled down and uh, we could hold that event because that will be the first of the possible events. It's the first weekend of October in Baltimore. And uh, I hope I can, I can do that again. I, I think it's wishful thinking, but again, Brock, nobody oh, knows know, anything. I've seen a yeah. number of people who have said uh, on Facebook and other social media, look, I don't care whether they're holding this convention. I believe I'm not going anywhere. This is them speaking, not going anywhere yeah. through the end of the year until it's vaccine. <laughs> that's, that's oh. really hopeful thinking. Uh, that's that's end of next year for I know, but I know. if everything goes great. But you know, again, we'll yeah. we'll see what a. Uh, I mean, I'm I'm uh, supposed to get into this long negotiation with FDA beginning this fall, and it's a thing I did five years ago. We go down there in person, no remote connection, et cetera. And industry is already pushing back with, we don't know what things are going to be like, and putting us in a conference room for six hours at a time with people whose status we don't know right. is a recipe for a super spreader situation. So, right. The only way this is going to work yeah. if the testing is truly out there and everyone knows whether they have this or not. And it will be like, I hate to bring up the porn industry, but it will be like the porn industry when everyone was tested for AIDS and you had to prove before you went on the set that you were clean. And who knows? Oh, that's, that still goes on now. Yeah. Stoya was on the, the show a few months ago. We're supposed to record one of these check-ins. And if anything, they're sort of ahead of the curve, people who are in that world, because they know what it's like to have that assumption of you're not clean unless, you know, we've got certification. So Right. It will yeah. have to be you can't come to this convention unless you have been tested within a certain amount of time and you were clean. And then even then everyone will worry uh, yeah. about who. Because you're on a plane. Have. Yeah. And as yeah. I said, uh, you know, I mentioned your name yesterday on the latest episode of my podcast because I wanted to thank you for introducing me to the site, the Zencaster that you, we are using to record this show to get both sides of our conversation cleanly. It's all Matt. It's Matt Ruff. And, Matt well, Ruff I, is the guy who turned me on to it. But yeah. Well, I mentioned your name twice doing the podcast. I didn't mention it three times like Beetlejuice, but then you appeared and said, "Come on and do this," because I mentioned <laughs> yeah. it. But but I did one episode of my podcast with this because I'm resisting doing remote episodes because I want to sit across the table with someone with the food and have this conversation. And I did an episode with a writer named Sarah Pinsker. There was only one ep one person on the planet with whom I was willing to do a remote episode of what's supposed to be a food conversation where people forget they're even having a conversation and just having a meal with it with a friend because her novel, A Song for a New Day, which came out in September 2019, was about a terrorist attack which resulted in a pandemic and shut down the country. So mass gatherings are banned. People are not to go, allowed to go to sporting events. We can only get together in virtual reality. And the basic story is these musicians who just love playing. How do you have music without a, an audience or having these illegal performances and traveling across the country and doing what they're not supposed to be doing. And I thought doing an episode with Sarah Pinsker would be like cosplaying and role-playing her novel. <laughs> and <laughs> that's why for her, it seemed right and just and poetic to do an episode, you know, discussing what is it like to live in the world of this novel? And aren't you glad the book came out in September, 2019 and not September, 2020, when people would say, oh, I see where you got to their, that idea, not realizing it takes longer than that to get a yeah. book written and a book uh, published. But uh, so the episode that went live on Sunday was with her. And you got mentioned because I thanked you and told people to come listen to the Virtual Memory Show because you are my spiritual father. 
that's uh, Podfather, so, please. Yeah. Podfather, yeah. It's the Podfather I have. <laughs> but yeah, from then a, on, uh, so for me, yeah. there's just going to be one more episode uh, of Treading Water. I asked all former guests and asked listeners to come up with questions, and I would eat a meal at home while pulling questions out of a hat. And if there's anything that did not come up in the previous 120 episodes, that's what episode 119 is. And I guess I'm going to do 121. And after that, I'm on hiatus until the world opens up again. Perhaps I'll start a totally different podcast. I don't know, but Eating the Fantastic cannot continue uh, without people looking across the table and having that special magical thing that happens in a restaurant when people might forget uh, the mics are on. So, hey, maybe I'll get more writing done. I'm certainly getting about to get more reading done because as you yeah. know, from running a podcast and you do it weekly, so it's even rougher for <laughs> Daily you. Daily now, but yeah. <laughs> you know, because if you're really doing a good job for a podcast, I would sit down before talking to a guest and read or reread every word that they have written that I can get my hands on. So there was little time for pleasure reading when you were doing, for me, it was basically bi-weekly. But still, if you're saying, well, I'm going to read or reread or skim these five novels and read the short stories they've written and read their other interviews before we chat, and all of a sudden I'm saying, wow, I uh, have a chance to I start. i this time now. Yeah, yeah now yeah. I, can, I can pick up a, a book that I meant to read that's on this pile and read something just for pleasure without intending to do an interview uh, with this person. So, so that's a change to my life. <laughs> yeah. Now what's the, what, what sort of books or authors are you looking to, to tackle as, as, you know, discretionary reading? Well, the books I am looking uh, to read now, I have a couple of novels, the, the uh, new novel by Annalie Newitz, and I'm going to be very embarrassed because I know it's something, a story for another timeline. I'm going to get the title of the book all wrong, <laughs> but uh, you know that's a book I I very much want to read that I have. Uh, uh, Kellen Spar's new novel Docile uh, has come out. I have a book by Sam J. Miller's. Is it called Blackfish City? I see I'm like babble all the titles wrong, but if you just look up, I only knew it's K. M. Spar S. Z. P. A. R. A. and Sam J. Miller's latest novels. Those are the three that have been at the top of the list that I will be diving into. So no older stuff that you were just, you know, I've always wanted to get to X, Y, or Z. Well, and, believe and... me, you know, one of the things that I was reading that I was starting to reread <laughs> a couple mm -hmm. of weeks ago when I was really feeling down, I was reading Middlemarch. Yeah. I picked up Middlemarch. I find uh, a lot of comfort and hope uh, in Middlemarch, even though uh, there are depressing things uh, as well. But I just love uh, the ending of it, and I wish I had it in front of me so I could quote it exactly, but there's some line about uh, so much of the beauty and history of the world depends on people whose names are forgotten, who lay in unmarked graves, something like that, which may not sound hopeful the way I mention it, uh, but it basically sums up in that final paragraph uh, the fact that the beauty of the world and the things that happen in the world are not all dependent upon you know, the great men theory of the world, that, sure. that all of us and those of us who are little remembered and often forgotten have changed the world in beautiful ways and affected each other in ways you cannot imagine. And I go back and read some of that book and always dive into that last paragraph, which someday I imagine I should commit to memory the way so many people have committed the last paragraph of The Great Gatsby. But mm -hmm. that last section of Middlemarch, I find tremendously hopeful. So that's, that's an older work uh, that I definitely dove into just a few weeks ago to find some more hope. Hmm. I would end with that, but I, I do want to ask the one question. Does your background in zombie fiction prepare you at all for, for the way the pandemic developed and progressed? I, I wish I could, but it's just, you know, the thing that someone else came up with that has become a meme on, which is truly the 
best thing that anyone can say about zombies of the pandemic, and I don't know who originated this thought, which I saw on Twitter, is that the one thing all zombie fiction gets wrong is the fact that there are going to be tons of people standing around protesting and denying that zombies actually exist. Or asking for the right to be bitten. Yeah. That's correct. Yeah. That is correct. So, so, so to me, that ended up being the thing that from zombiehood most relates to what we're going through. Understood. I hope I hope October happens. I hope at some point in the future you and I get to sit down at a table and uh, nosh and record. We'll meet again. In don't fact, know where, where, where would you take me for, uh, for uh, a meal? Where would you want to take me for uh, uh, eating the fantastic? Podcast well, meal. where we were going to go, we were going to probably end up doing it in the D.C. area, I assumed, when you're in there, or if we were doing it in Bethesda, I would have to think about that because I'm trying to remember what your tastes are. The last time we got together, uh, in which I went out and took you to a meal at a steakhouse to, in uh, Bethesda, I think, to thank you for all you did in helping my podcast uh, come to be and all the advice, we went to this a uh, nice steakhouse, the name of which I'm totally forgetting. Yeah, uh, I remember it was really noisy. It was hip. But yeah, it, I think it had that open uh, open wall thing to the outside, so we had a lot of yeah. a lot of street noise. Not, but, you know. a, not a place where one is meant to, meant to record. I, I'll, I'll give it some thought. So when, when we do come together again, we'll be all set, and I can give you some cheeky guys. Because also, I don't make the decision totally on my own. I say to a guest, what is your favorite kind of food? What do you really like to eat? If it's Indian, I'll find you the best Indian restaurant around or Thai or like seafood or whatever. So I really want it to be tied to what the guests like. So the real question is, Gil, is what is your favorite kind of restaurant? I'm really insanely wide open when it comes to, to cuisine. My thing when I'm in D.C. is usually to get over to DuPont, hit second story books, and then go to the Thai place just down the, the uh, down the hill from it. And it's a, it's a basement restaurant. I take people there because nobody goes there. And, you know, I can get a, a nice bowl of, or a nice plate of pad thai and, and roll. But But somewhere, you know. Not fancy, but just somewhere interesting to to go. I'll, I'll look forward to when you and I get together. Okay. Well, I know you like going to Jaleo, but that's not a, a podcasty place. I think I was there no, recently. That, that, that's, that's taking fifty pharmaceutical people for a, a festival, uh, right? Evening, like my uh, my day job. But too much, too much of a party place. Yeah, although you do get the big bull head with the luchadori mask uh, mounted on the wall there. But but anyway, that's well, a, a separate... Well, yeah, let us hope that when we get together, you and I will not have to be wearing luchadori masks. <laughs> <laughs> that could make for an interesting podcast, but we'll see. So there was anyway. a restaurant I was once at during a World Fantasy Convention in San Diego uh, that was luchadori themed. And if you showed up wearing a luchadori mask, you got 10% off your check. I did not have one at hand, however. No, and I'm not sure how you'd eat with it on, but yeah, yeah, we're all about making a mask. Once you pay, that's all that matters. Get the 10% off and then take the mask yeah. off. <laughs> cool, man. We'll talk soon. And, you know, I hope uh, I hope you're able to, to get out and about and, and the world opens up our conventions again. Yes, as do I. Well, you stay safe out there. Wear your mask. Wash your hands. Uh, be careful. I know you're doing those runs to stay in shape, so make sure that you're all running in the correct direction to maintain social distance. No one running clockwise while someone else is counterclockwise. No, no, I'm hip. Where I live, it's so low density and everybody is so lazy. I get out in the morning and <laughs> nobody's out doing anything. So, yeah, I, I'm able to, to do all this without putting anybody at risk, especially myself. So. Good to know. But yeah. Cool, man. We'll talk soon. Yep. Stay safe. And that was Scott Edelman. Go check out his website, scottedelman.com, for more about his books and stories, his reviews and, and videos of his panels, and his great podcast, Eating the Fantastic. You can also find the podcast at eatingthefantastic.com, as well as iTunes and other venues. And you'll find the RSS feed. You can plug that into your favorite podcatcher. And you can follow Scott on Twitter and Instagram at Scott Edelman and on Facebook as Scott dot Edelman. And that's S-C-O-T-T-E-D-E-L-M-A-N. Uh, Scott added afterwards the three books that he mentioned wanting to get to just so he doesn't screw up the titles are Blackfish City by Sam J. Miller, 
Docile by K.M. Zvara, and that's S-Z-P-A-R-A, and Future of Another Timeline by Annalee Newitz. Newitz is N-E-W-I-T-Z. And that piece from the end of uh, the end of Middlemarch goes like this. But the effect of her being on those around her was incalculab- incalculably diffusive. For the growing good of the world is partly dependent on unhistoric acts. And that things are not so ill with you and me as they might have been is half owing to the number who lived faithfully a hidden life and rest in unvisited tombs. We should be back tomorrow with another COVID check-in episode. I don't have anyone scheduled yet, but we'll see how the day progresses. If you want to send me a little update to read on the air or have something you want to share with the listeners, let me know and we'll set something up. I'm at groth18 at gmail.com. You can find my contact info at our sites, vmspod.com and chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also find a link to the COVID-19 sessions at both sites with all of these daily episodes. And you can also just subscribe to the Virtual Memory Show via iTunes, Spotify, or other podcatchers to make sure you get every episode. In the before time, I always recorded in person, but now I'm using Zencaster.com to record remotely. If you're interested in it, it's spelled Z-E-N-C-A-S-T-R, so no final E. The pro level is 20 bucks a month. There's also a free hobbyist level, and they've opened that up during the pandemic to let more people use the service. But as far as the 20 bucks a month goes, don't worry about that. My job pays me pretty well. Plus, I've got a lot of great Patreon supporters who more than cover my expenses for the show, uh, which now consists basically of the Zencaster plus Libsyn 20 bucks a month for hosting. Um, in the before time, again, I used to have to pay for parking, tolls, uh, subway trips, travel for, you know, exotic locations at these various cons and festivals that Scott would mention and, and more. But nowadays, it's just uh, just Zencaster, my existing mic setup, and uh, that's pretty much it. If you can spare anything, uh, what I'm saying is don't give it to me. Give it to the writers and artists and other creative people who... Um, whose work you love. Most of them have Patreons, Kickstarters, Indiegogos, tip jars, whatever. Um, if you can't find that sort of venue, then give to your local charities, food banks, etc., and just try to give to, to places that'll help people in need. And I am Gil Roth. It is April 29th, 2020, and this was a bonus episode of my Virtual Memories Show podcast. Thanks for listening. Keep the conversation going. Stay safe and wash your damn hands.